Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Metri. But I want to talk a little bit about what I call the cult of Guanyin. And by cult, I don't mean that in the modern sense of some crazy guy who leads people off to wear purple tennis shoes and think they're all going to be taken away in a spaceship. Uh, I mean it in a sense of, in the Catholic Church, they have a clear cult of Mary, or they have a clear cult of Joseph, which is a sincerely held devotion to an individual. Um, and that's what I mean when I talk about this cult of Guanyin. And I want to talk about how it developed just a little bit. So I'm not trying to play stump the chump, but does anyone happen to know what's in the Lotus Sutra in chapter 25? Well, probably not until I tell you, but chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra is entirely, and it's sometimes called the Guanyin Sutra or the Avalokiteshvara Sutra. Uh, now, the interesting part about this is the word Guanyin or Guanxiyin, as they actually say in Chinese uh, in the complete sense, uh, is actually how they translate Avalokiteshvara, which, excuse my, uh, my bad Sanskrit and my bad Mandarin, but it basically means one who hears the cries of the world, okay, or one who hears the voices of the world. And so this Guanxi Yin, as was translated from the Prakrit language of, it wasn't, it was clearly not true Sanskrit that uh, the Lotus Sutra was originally written in. But when it was translated, Avalokiteshvara was translated into Guanxi Yin in Chinese. And most of the versions that we have of the Lotus Sutra nowadays come from the Chinese translations, not from these early Prakrit versions. Um, so just to read you just a, just a few lines of this. Um, so chapter 25 is called The Universal Door of Guanxi Yin Bodhisattva. And this, again, is the 25th chapter of the Lotus Sutra. At that time, inexhaustible intention Bodhisattva rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, placed his palms together, and facing the Buddha, said, world-honored one, for what reason is the Bodhisattva Guan Shi Ying called, Guri, called Guan Shi Ying? The Buddha told inexhaustible intention Bodhisattva, good man, if any of the limitless hundreds of thousands of myriads of kotis of living beings who are undergoing all kinds of suffering, hear of Guan Shi Yin Bodhisattva and recite his name single-mindedly, Guan Shi Yin Bodhisattva will immediately hear their voices and rescue them. And this was the beginning of this lore or, or cult of, of Guan Shi Yin that began its trek through China and East Asia. Um, and I, I point out to you here, when the Lotus Sutra was compiled and translated into Chinese, uh, it, scientists and, and historians kind of um, differ on exactly the year. Nobody knows exactly the year that it was first translated into Chinese, but sometime in the first or second century AD or, or CE, as people like to call it nowadays, um, we know that the Lotus Sutra was first translated into Chinese. And this concept of Avalokiteshvara obtaining the name of Guan Shi Yin came about. But at that time, he was still recognized as a masculine figure. That masculine figure of Avalokiteshvara from the, you know, the ancient days, so to speak, of India. But from that time forward, we see this cynicization or this Chinese making morphing of Guan Shi Yin into what we think of as Guan Shi Yin today. Um, and when anybody asks who's Guan Shi Yin, we all kind of have the same concept in our mind of who this is. And having lived for the past year in, in East Asia, believe me, this idea of Guan Shi Yin or Guan Teom as they call her in Vietnam, is not this masculine figure of old, and it's not this androgynous figure that really doesn't have a gender. It's clearly a female form. Um, 
and she plays an important role in the culture that kind of spans between Buddhism and non-Buddhism in these East Asian cultures. And that's what began to happen around the same time that Zen began, began to form in China. And so these are kind of uh, co-developing phenomenon in China, that there's the Zen thread, and then there's this idea of the Guanxi Yin um, that is caught up in a, a lot of the Tendai versions of the uh, of early Chi of early Chinese Buddhism, um, as well as the Pure Land versions of, of Chinese Buddhism that began to form. Um, and so, in about well, it's the it's the middle of the Tang Dynasty. So the Tang Dynasty was approximately somebody help me out if you know better than me. It's approximately six hundred. Um, AD to 1000 AD. This is about the time that Zen really began to form into its own, uh, and we had the great Zen masters of old, um, including, um, you know, Huang Po, for example, um, who was considered to be one of the teachers of Lin Ji, right, who kind of founded the version of Zen that we follow uh, with our koan readings and learnings and, and those types of things. So Huang Po, um, was even so bold to say in some of his writings, you know, don't follow this, this uh, pure land version of Buddhism because all that's going to do is trap you in a cycle of karma. Instead, follow this clear mind version of Buddhism that he was teaching of, of Zen, um, which was to alleviate your karma, not to create this cycle of karma that he, that he uh, more or less disparaged Pure Land Buddhism as to creating that you would continue to create this cycle of good karma uh, and in order to try to get rid of your bad karma and then you could be reborn in a in a in a pure land uh, where you could receive your final uh, nirvana or final uh, enlightenment or awakening. Um, so Hong Po didn't really like that and that kind of got passed on to his students, including Lin Ji, etc. But we have this concept that continued. Like I said, because they developed around the same time and Zen um, became initially Chan, of course, it became this uh, distinctly Chinese um, sect of Buddhism, which, as all of us know, uh, incorporated a lot of Taoism into it. Uh, you know, it was even uh, it was even our great grandfather of, of the Dharma, Sung San, who said basically, uh, Buddhism and Taoism got together, they got married, had a baby, and they called it Zen. And that was kind of, you know, the creation of Zen in, in the East was this morphing of Buddhism and, and Taoism. But like I said, so along the same lines, uh, Guan Shi Yin began with her current name, as we call her a her nowadays, began with her current name in the Lotus Sutras that was translated into Chinese. And so I just want to share a couple of things with you, a little bit of, again, I'm going to call it my, uh, my um, show and tell. But I'm going to start this off with just maybe 30 seconds or 40 seconds of So my guess is most of you have heard some of that before. Uh, and it's, it's actually pretty long. It's 20, 30 minute long recording of, of the monks and nuns and, and uh, the Plum Village tradition, Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition, uh, which is a Vietnamese Zen 
um, order. Um, paying homage to Avalokiteshvara, which interestingly enough, they don't call Guan Yin or Guan Te Am, which is the Vietnamese word for um, this modern version. But by modern, I mean this creation where um, Avalokiteshvara takes on a feminine form. Um, but anyway, I want to show you now, if I can, let me go back to my sharing. So I have a little collection here, and uh, if I can share this with you, hopefully you guys can all see it. Um, these are pictures just of Guanyin, Guan Te Am, um, and all of her different forms. And these are all from Vietnamese temples. The first two are actually from Vietnamese temples in California, but that's kind of the traditional version as we see of Guan Yin uh, in most modern temples nowadays. This one again in California. And the rest of these now are in Vietnam. Very similar. Um, this is on an island in, in the kind of the middle of the Mekong River. Um, and there's this whole temple just to Guan Te Am or the Chinese version Guan Xi. And then this is in um, Ho Chi Minh City. And so I, I won't spend a lot of time on these, but I want you to see how the majority of these are very feminine in form. Unless you go back to something like this, which is kind of the ancient version um, where you see she has all of these hands and all these eyes or heads that can see everything in the world. Um, but just in that section of town that I lived in when I was in Saigon, there were two separate temples just dedicated to Guan Yin. Um, and they were both called the Guan Yin Temple or the Guan Am, Guan Am, Chua Guan Am in Vietnamese. Um, but they all contain these giant statues. And now interestingly, you can go into some of these temples and you might see 20 or 30, maybe more, maybe hundreds of Guan Yin statues and only one or two statues of the Buddha, whether, whether it be uh, Shakyamuni Buddha or uh, Amitabha Buddha, you will almost only see Guan Yin statues. And you see they, even on the side at the gates, they have these little various versions of Guan Yin uh, statues that set up where people can make, leave offerings. Uh, and you see she's wearing many different robes, but they're all very feminine. Um, you see she, what, a, what a central role she plays here uh, in this standing statue and there's statues all around her of Buddha, but those are, those are minor characters actually. And so, and so some of these temples, Guan Yin um, plays, if not the dominant role, definitely a dominant role. Uh, and in some of them, she plays the dominant role. Um, and you see in some of them, it's a little androgynous. You can't really tell if it's a male or a female. And some of them, like this one or the one before it, where she has lots of rosy cheek makeup on, it's clearly very feminine in form. And so what I, and okay. And so I went to this museum uh, that they had uh, and they had lots of different versions of statues from around the world of, of Guan Yin or Avalokiteshvara. And this one predates the sinicization of Avalokiteshvara. And so you see it's clearly a male form. Um, so it's clearly from before the first or second century uh, sinicization of, of Avalokiteshvara into Guan, Guan Yin. Um, so I'll go through these a little bit quicker. Again, it wasn't intended to be a show and tell, but it, I wanted to talk about what, what happened here and why uh, Guan Yin needed to be made into a more or less a Chinese deity. 
Uh, and then how does that still fit within Buddhism today? Um, this kind of is the, the very feminine, real cynicization of what we think of uh, as of Guanyin today. Um, clearly feminine in form. Uh, this is kind of in that transitionary period where the male form of Avalokiteshvara is slowly transforming into a female form. And this happened over a few centuries um, in China and, of course, and in the, the realms of, of China. And so um, if I can go back to stop sharing these. <clears throat> Okay, so what happened here? Well, as, as Buddhism came to East Asia, um, it was a foreign religion. It really was, right? It came from India, um, and it didn't meet a lot of what the native people understood as their sensibilities of what is compassion. When we think of the Buddha, we think of him teaching compassion but compassion was not known as a masculine trait in China. And so in order to teach compassion, they needed to place this in a way or, or construct a, a method of teaching compassion that fit to their normal cultural ideas or sensitivities. And one of those was to transform these ideas uh, of compassion and loving kindness and, um, and the ability to listen to someone. Uh, again, men were not known for being great listeners, right? But if somebody had a problem, who'd they go talk to? They talked to their mom or their wife or their sister. It would be it was this compassionate motherly trait that was um, needed in Chinese culture in order for them to accept this bodhisattva um, as, as a teaching method or something expedient, as we might have called it in, uh, in the Lotus Sutra, uh, as, a, as an expedient method of teaching. And so slowly over the centuries that Zen began to develop, Avalokiteshvara took on this very feminine form, took on the feminine form so much so that by the time that Christian missionaries began to, began to arrive in Southern China in the 15th and 16th centuries, they were hiring artisans in southern Fujian province of China to make statues of the Madonna and the baby Jesus. And then those same statues were then morphed just a little bit to create a Guanyin holding a baby. And because there was this concept and you can even read it in the Lotus Sutra in chapter 25, there was this concept that if people would pray to Guanyin, that they could have a, a healthy baby. And in Chinese culture, that became this idea of having a healthy male baby because it was the male child that carried on the family's name and tradition, etc. And so it became very important under this filial idea of, of Confucianism in China that families needed someone to bless them to have male babies. And that's what Guan Yin had turned into. So uh, I raised this to you today because I showed you these pictures from Vietnam and I just wanted you to see them. And if you think of, uh, there, was, there was a well-known split in about 900 or 1000 AD, um, there was a well-known split between the north and south of, uh, of Zen. In China, there was a split in China of north and south, and Zen kind of had a northern patriarch and a southern patriarch. Um, this all happened kind of, if you remember in the Platform Sutra, and Hui Nung would tell us that he came from the south, and everybody just assumed that he was stupid and he didn't know anything because he was this poor southerner, right? And, uh, and so what I'm trying to tell you is the south was basically um, what we call Guangzhou in the southern part of China, but that went all the way down into northern Vietnam. And so North Vietnam, that Hanoi area, all the way down to Hue, which is where Thich Nhat Hanh's original temple was from, uh, all the way down to that central part of Vietnam was considered southern China. And so in this development of Zen, and kind of in these northern schools and southern schools, uh, 
very much in this Chinese influence was this part of Vietnam. And so as I lived in Vietnam and you'd go to a temple and people prayed to Guan Yin, um, it was true devo devotion, much like you see Catholics pray to the Virgin Mary, for example. Uh, and there's a lot of this similarities between this, um, they, they would call her even um, uh, the Virgin of the Black Mountain, and they would have a they would have a black robed version of Guan Yin on the top of the mountain, for example. Um, and there was a lot of similarities of this crossover um, of the Virgin Mary and Guan Yin. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is this cult of Guan Yin is alive and well in East Asia. It's alive and well in China. There are parts of China you can go to and people do not even know that Guan Yin has any sort of connection to Buddhism. And the only part of Buddhism they know is Guan Yin. Uh, there are parts of Vietnam where it's very similar. Like I said, there'll be a temple and it's under the auspices of a Buddhist temple, but the Buddha himself um, plays a very, very small role. And people come and pay devotion to Guan Yin because they believe that she's the one that's going to protect them. She's the one that's going to bless them with riches or with children or whatever. Um, and it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, I just couldn't ignore, but I wanted to tie it into our development in, in Zen and how the Lotus Sutra still continues to play an important role in a lot of Zen organizations. Um, and it's certainly something to read and understand this idea of, oh, of uh, only one Dharma vehicle, um, not two, not three, but only one vehicle comes from the Lotus Sutra. Um, and those of you who have taken, um, uh, have taken multiple um, precepts uh, in the Zen order, such as our order, uh, you know, one of the things that we, what, that we vow to do is not to create separate orders. I mean, not to create separate uh, vehicles uh, and not to disparage vehicles, but to understand that there's one vehicle moving forward. And that all comes from the Lotus Sutra. So, uh, Anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you guys tonight was this idea that Guan Yin lives strong and well. Um, and when we, in our Zen tradition, still think of Avalokiteshvara, we still think of that person, that Bodhisattva, uh, in the way that we chant. We're going to chant here in a little bit when we chant to uh, the Heart Sutra. But um, that concept is, is originally a male form in Indian history. Uh, and as it moves and its cynicization turns into a very feminine, almost Madonna-like form uh, of East Asia. So uh, I hope that's somewhat educational to you, but you see the, 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 the basis of it is in the Lotus Sutra. Uh, and in how we practice today, we continue our practices around Avalokiteshvara and the messages that, uh, that he taught to Shariputra uh, in the Heart Sutra that we chant. So anyway, I leave that with you and... Uh, I hope that uh, you see a little bit of how uh, Zen and Buddhism are practiced in East Asia. So thank you.